There's a confusing array of creationist models. Um, there are the people who think that the world was created in seven literal days and, and that these represent ages. I can understand the people who, I don't understand why they think the earth is six to 10,000 years old now. That's an untenable position, but if that's what they believe, I can understand why understanding evolution would be more difficult for them because they don't even accept that that time is there. But I'm more baffled by the apologists and creationists who think, oh, of course, you know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, the Earth's 4.5 billion, but that's still not enough time when we have the evidence. Yeah, um, there, are, there are people like that. Um, uh, there was a, a nice story told by J.B.S. Haldane, the great uh, British geneticist, one of the founders of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Um, and after a lecture, a lady stood up and asked him a question and put exactly this point. She said, Professor Haldane, I simply can't believe that there's been enough time, even given billions of years, to go from a single-celled ancestor to something like me, you know, a multicellular cre creature, trillions of cells with the heart and lungs and brain and kidneys and bones and things. Just doesn't make sense. Madam, you did it yourself, and it only took you nine months. <laughs> To, to which, of course, she could have retorted, ah, yes, but um, that in that nine months, the process was supervised by DNA, or she would have called it genes in those days. Um, and, and that, of course, is correct. And, and what evolution does, what natural selection does, is to choose those genes that supervise the embryological process that does that amazing trick in nine months. So in this, in this process, one of the key aspects that we come up against is transitional forms. And people have different views of what that means. So a creationist might say, oh, you haven't found any transitional forms, or you haven't found a missing link. And for years, when I'm asked this question on the show, for, well, first of all, I point out that, uh, this, that you're calling into the atheist experience, and I'm not a biologist, and if you, you know, maybe you're talking to the wrong guy about this. But I had always responded that everything is a transitional form, that all of us are a tr transition between our ancestors and our progeny. And, and this, I don't know that this has the impact on others that it had on me. Because yes. they, seem to be they seem to be looking at it backwards. Backwards, it's a little easier to say, oh, this is clearly a transition. Yes, I mean, everything is potentially a transition. Not everything actually is, but potentially it is. Michael Shermer makes rather a nice point, which is that when there's a gap in the fossil record, which, which there is in quite a number of places, because fossilization is quite a rare event, so that we have this gap, they say, ah, oh, there's a gap. Um, and then somebody finds a fossil right in the middle of the gap, which is a transitional form. Now we've got two gaps. Yeah. And then they told two friends, and they told two <laughs> friends, and so on. It's, it's interesting to me that so much emphasis, I think, in, in the, as people were battling against this idea in the modern era, because we're trying to teach it in schools, and of course there are religious people objecting, this idea of a missing link kept yeah. coming up. Well, the missing link was often, was in Victorian times, that meant the missing link between apes and humans. Uh, and there were no fossils, it, uh, no, no hominid fossils in Darwin's time. Darwin looked at the modern anatomy of chimpanzees and gorillas and correctly inferred that we are African apes, that we, we evolved in Africa. And since that time, of course, there have been lots and lots of fossils discovered in South Africa, in East Africa, uh, and even North Africa. Um, so we have lots and lots of links. They're not missing anymore. They're missing on the chimpanzee side of the, of the divide. We have a common ancestor which was lived about six million years ago. And then it branched and went down one side towards chimpanzees and bonobos, which branched again there, and then the other side went down to humans. And we've got plenty of fossils down the human line. So there's no, no dearth of links there. They're no longer missing. There aren't any fossils down the chimpanzee line. And that's regrettable. It may be because they're forest dwellers and it's more difficult to fossilize in, in forest conditions. But there are plenty of missing links, no longer missing. But you can't know, you weren't there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. 
how do you deal with that kind of thing? Um, yes, of, of, of course. Uh, and what one analogy that I like to use to that is to say, a detective comes upon the scene of a crime after it's been committed, more or less by definition, and works out what happened. Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot. They look at fingerprints, they look at footprints, they look at all the cues that are available around the window open or the window closed or whatever it might be. And you work out what happened by looking at the clues. That's sort of what we do. But the difference is, whereas Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot had a limited number of clues, we have millions and millions and millions of clues. We have fossils, we have the geographical distribution of animals and plants on islands and continents of the world. They're distributed in exactly the places they should be distributed if evolution had taken place. Um, we look at fossils, we look at molecular, uh, comparative molecular um, sequencing. The, you can sequence the DNA or the proteins of any creature you like, animal or plant, and you can find genes that are clearly the same gene, but with differences in the details. And so you can literally count the number of discrepancies between um, a human and a, a possum, or a human and a beetle. It doesn't matter what it is, you can find a gene where it's the, obviously the same gene, and you can literally count the number of letter discrepancies between them. And you plot it all out, and you find a beautiful hierarchical tree, a beautiful pedigree. It's got to be a pedigree. And so that's what you can do with molecular data. That's sort of what Darwin himself was able to do with bones and comparative anatomy. And that's persuasive enough, goodness knows. But with molecules, it's even more persuasive. So you don't have to have been there. It's, it's, it's the, the, the evidence is just mountainously high. I think this ties back a, a lot into uh, different views of knowledge, where they, when it's convenient, they would like there to be certainty. And I, I'm always happy to point out that they believe in Jesus, and they weren't there when he was crucified as well. Uh, so clearly, we can infer some things and, and come to reasonable conclusions. When we talk about science, it's a couple of the beautiful things about science is that it's self-correcting, and yet the creationists will just constantly point to, oh, here's an anomaly, here's an error, here's a mistake, here's a hoax, as if, as if they could disprove evolution and all of a sudden their creation model wins. And to me it was, even if we find out tomorrow that everything we understood about natural selection were wrong, that still wouldn't lend any credence to That's right. No, I mean, you, you, you have two, two hypotheses, A and B, and A has a lot going for it, and B has nothing whatever going for it. So, and, then, and, then, and then you find a single, a single slight discrepancy. Something went wrong with A, as you say, a hoax, piltdown man, whatever it is. Right, that's it for A, it must be B. And th that's the level of logic we have to deal with. Oh. You have an alibi. Oh, the butler did it then. Yes, yes. We're, we're done. Exactly, yes, exactly. 